tonight. Why Mark Norman was cleared. There's no reasonable prospect of conviction. CBC News finds out what changed the Crown's mind, but will it close the political case? Where do violent Canadian criminals get their guns? It's not just a border issue. Can we have a little peek at him? We just can't quite see his face. And saying hello to baby Archie, the royal with the name that's got everyone talking. This is The National. As dramas go, this criminal case seemed to have it all. A highly decorated senior military official, allegations of leaked information, and a political backstory that could explode just in time for a federal election. But it all came to an abrupt end when today the charges against Vice Admiral Mark Norman were dropped. Now, CBC News has learned why they were dropped, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, to understand any of this, you have to look back to 2015. Stephen Harper's government awarded a $700 million contract to Quebec's Davy Shipyard to convert a commercial ship into a Navy supply ship. Shortly after the new Liberal government came into power, it quietly paused to review the deal. But when information was leaked to a reporter that that contract was on ice, the feds backtracked and approved it. But where did the leak come from? The Liberals had the RCMP investigate. That's when Mark Norman, the military's second in command, comes into the picture. The RCMP alleged that for more than a year, he had leaked cabinet secrets to, quote, unauthorized parties, including Davy. Norman was suspended and eventually charged with breach of trust. So why today's stunning reversal? Why did prosecutors let this high-profile case go? Murray Brewster has followed this trial from the very beginning, and he's got the answer. How do you feel this morning, Vice Admiral? The case against Vice Admiral Mark Norman began to collapse in March, all thanks to evidence dug up by his defense team and presented to the Crown. It was important to us. We had some information. We didn't have the entire information. How do you the Crown refused to specify what that information was, but said it meant there was little chance of conviction. Now, CBC News has learned some of what that was. Norman's lawyers interviewed former Conservative cabinet ministers and staffers, people not questioned by the RCMP or the Crown. What they found was Norman, in dealing with Davy Shipbuilding, worked in close cooperation with former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's office, something that helped change the context of the allegations. There was also information the government had in its possession about the shipbuilding deal. It should have been handed over. It should have been handed over to the RCMP. It should have been handed over to the prosecution. It was not. As to the why, I don't know. I'll leave you to answer that. One person Norman is alleged to have leaked to says the prosecution was a travesty of justice. There'll be a time, uh, Murray, to chat about other things as this gets more explored. Today, I want to talk about the fact that justice has been uh, served and uh, uh, Mark Norman is uh, innocent, as we've always said he is. It is a bittersweet vindication over two years after the RCMP first raided his home. I am confident that uh, at all times I acted with integrity, I acted ethically, and I acted in the best interest of the Royal Canadian Navy, the Canadian Forces, and ultimately the people of Canada. The Chief of the Defence Staff said tonight Norman will be welcomed back. The question is, what will he do? His job has been given to someone else. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. So that's the end of the trial, but not the end of the story. Not according to Mark Norman and his lawyer, and certainly not according to the opposition, who had some pointed questions today. David Cochran looks at that angle for us. Oral questions, questions oral. The Crown dropped its prosecution of Mark Norman, but the Conservatives continued theirs of Justin Trudeau. Why is it that anyone who says no to this Prime Minister ends up with a target on their back? We have had documents withheld, we've had witnesses silenced, and we have seen a personal attack on the reputation of a revered public servant. They insist this was a vendetta, as much a persecution as prosecution. 
which Trudeau flatly denies. The process involved in, uh, in a public prosecution like this is entirely independent uh, of my office. Uh, it's an independent process and we have confidence in uh, the work done by the Director of Public Prosecution. But 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 Trudeau is backed by the Director of Public Prosecutions, Kathleen Roussel, who issued a statement saying no other factors were considered in this decision, nor was there any contact or political influence. That's the same Kathleen Roussel who is prosecuting SNC-Lavalin on bribery and fraud charges despite government efforts to get the company a deferred prosecution agreement. No pressure, no discussions. Absolutely not. They, they made their decision without any influence. No influence, but a definite measure of relief. This spares the government a potentially embarrassing trial with well-known liberals on the witness stand in the run-up to the fall election. Mr. Speaker, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Canadians deserve the truth. With no trial, the NDP called for an inquiry. The Liberals wouldn't do that, but did say they'd pick up Norman's tab. Regarding uh, a Vice Admiral Norman's request to have his legal fees paid for as relates to this case, I agree with this Vice, uh, Mr. Speaker, and have authorized it. Paying the legal costs, hoping to avoid the political ones. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, Ian, back to you and turning to a courtroom proceeding that did go forward today. Andrew, the sentencing hearing has begun for Mohammed Shamji, the Toronto neurosurgeon's crime murdering his wife. Shocking to some, but not uncommon. The murder of family physician Alana Frick fits a pattern of violence in this country. Of every violent crime reported to police in 2017, 30%, nearly one-third, was committed by an intimate partner. According to the Canadian Women's Foundation, a woman is killed by her partner every six days. The Chamji beat and strangled Frick to death in 2016, that he's receiving what's described as a life sentence, neither is in dispute. The question is how long before he's eligible to apply for parole? Both the Crown and Defence agree that should be no less than 14 years. Joanna Remiliotis tells us what was said in court today was met with tears and rage. The children can barely talk about their mother. It's still too hard. Today was a glimpse into a family's shattered lives. In court, Anna Frick spoke first as her daughter's killer stared ahead. The nightmare that began that day has never ended and will never end until the day I die. He has destroyed all our lives forever. The children still cannot bear to have their mother mentioned because it is so painful to them. As Mother's Day approaches, she went on, sobbing. Instead of making cards and trinkets for their mother, they lay flowers on her grave. Alana Frick's body was found in a suitcase. It had been dumped in a river north of Toronto, her hair cut off, her face so swollen, when police asked her parents to identify her, they barely could. The horror of having to identify my daughter after her brutal murder, when she was virtually unrecognizable, will haunt me forever. Court also heard from Frick's friends and colleagues who described her as a rising star, a devoted doctor and mother. Few knew behind the happy facade, the abuse was escalating, that she intended to divorce Shamji. He admits he killed her, days after he found out. While no one condones his crime, defense also read out 14 letters of support from Shamji's family, colleagues and former patients. It was hard for the Fricks to listen to, even harder when Shamji addressed the court, turning to apologize to them. I've thought back to that night, he said. I should have killed myself and not Alana. Frick's sister muttered, yes, you should have. He went on. To our children, Yasmin, Faiza, and Marius, I have devastated your lives. I have hurt you immeasurably. I can only say I'm sorry. Just a ploy, just a show, you know. After court, caught, Frick's I'm sister, myself, Caroline Lakich, was still I'd seething. The wrong life was taken. You should have taken your own. You took a valuable life. If you didn't like yours, why kill somebody else? You're the menace to society. As no. for his apology... It's bullshit. I don't believe it. He, he, he's, he's, only, he's only sad because he got caught. He's not sad for my sister. He's not sad at all. Shamji's sentence will be handed down tomorrow. Among them, no one expects it will bring justice. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. A Christian Pakistani woman who fears for her life has found refuge in Canada. 
Asiya Bibi's case has garnered worldwide attention, casting an unflattering light on Pakistan's blasphemy laws and inciting mob violence. Her trouble started as a squabble with neighbors which spiraled out of control. Muslim women working in the fields objected to Bibi using a shared drinking cup. She was accused of insulting the Prophet Muhammad, arrested and eventually sentenced to death. Bibi spent eight years on death row before being acquitted by Pakistan's top court last year. She's been in hiding ever since. As Salima Shivji tells us, getting her safely to Canada wasn't easy. As news broke that Asiya Bibi was finally out of Pakistan and here in Canada, the Liberal government uh, wasn't saying no much. Comment. Obviously there are uh, uh, sensitive privacy issues and security issues on this and unfortunately I can't comment at this time. We understand that uh, the uh, court uh, decisions have been upheld and that uh, she will be uh, um, returning, to, will, will, will be uh, in, in a safe place. A stark contrast to the very public greeting when Canada offered refuge to Saudi teenager Rahaf Mohammed. In Asia Bibi's case, it's believed much was done through back channels and quiet talks among several countries. Canada made this offer and we felt it was right and appropriate that we supported the offer that Canada had made. The ongoing concern how to keep her safe. Two Pakistani politicians who stood beside her over the years fighting against their country's blasphemy laws were assassinated. Shabazz Bhatti, Pakistan's then Minister of Minorities, was one of them. It's no uh, word to express my feelings. It's hard. His brother Peter has lived in Canada for years. I feel that his uh, sacrifice not go in vain and it's bring a fruit when I see that Asia will be set free and especially in Canada where we are living this is my home country now so I feel proud he calls it a bold step and doesn't worry about a possible retaliation against Canada I sent this letter to Justin Trudeau for those who've been following the case closely petitioning the Prime Minister the guess is the government's reluctance to talk is part of a deal with Islamabad something that the Pakistani government would have asked the Canadian government to do, not to crow about it. So no public displays this time. Azia Bibi is now with two of her daughters in an undisclosed Canadian city, adjusting to freedom and a new reality. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. To Washington now, where Donald Trump's White House has been on a collision course with the U.S. Congress. And as Paul Hunter tells us, it looks like they've just made impact. Think the rhetoric, the name calling, and fury Democrats aim at Donald Trump is fierce already? Consider the House Judiciary Committee this morning. I can only conclude that the president now seeks to take a wrecking ball through the Constitution of the United States of America. Stonewaller the in chief, the they the called United him today, a wannabe dictator, slamming Trump and his fellow Republicans. Shame, shame, shame. We are in danger, we need to respond, and we need to act for the people of the United States of America. The breadth of this obstruction is beyond anything in our nation's history. All of it over an extraordinary step taken by the president this morning. Trump invoked the rarely used executive privilege to thwart Democratic demands for an unredacted copy of the special counsel's report into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Democrats say it's an abuse of White House powers coming as they themselves took an extraordinary step. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Voting to recommend citing Trump's Attorney General, William Barr, for contempt of Congress over his failure to offer up that unredacted report. Committee Chair Jerry Nadler framed the whole thing a constitutional crisis. It is an attack on the essence of our democracy, and we must uh, oppose this with every fiber of our being. Get the feeling this won't end nicely with all of this likely to end up in the courts. The battling gets ever more tense almost daily and the steps taken ever more extreme. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Here's some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National, including the latest development in the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Her lawyers told a Vancouver court today her extradition case should be thrown out. It was stated that the political factors 
at play during the extradition process may lead to serious violation of justice. Meng is accused of violating U.S. trade sanctions and was arrested at Vancouver Airport in December at the request of U.S. authorities. Her lawyers have argued that comments by Donald Trump indicate the case is politically motivated. Interestingly, the U.S. Senate passed a resolution today praising the Canadian government for its conduct during the case. Today I'm announcing details of the transformation agreement that will benefit the Oshawa employees, our Oshawa community and the Canadian auto sector. That announcement was a $170 million investment in the General Motors plant in Oshawa. GM had previously said the facility would close by the end of the year, but now the site will transition from vehicle assembly to other operations. It's expected to save 300 of the 2,500 jobs at the plant. And rules around blood donations in Canada have been relaxed for gay and bisexual male donors. The so-called deferral period for men in that group, how long since they've had sex, is dropping from one year to just three months. Back in 2016, the deferral period was lowered from five years down to one, but an independent watchdog group says the system is still discriminatory. Prince Harry and Meghan introduced their baby boy to the world today, but it was pretty quiet for a royal debut. They chose to keep the moment to a very small group of media. And later, they announced their son's name as well. Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. Thomas Daigle takes us through the day and what people think of the name. In the grandeur of Windsor Castle, this baby's big reveal was meant to be as low-key as can be. The star of the show sleeping through it all. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... He gets that from <laughs> Doting dad Harry, holding his baby so close, photographers had to ask to get a good view. Can we have a little peek at We just can't quite see his face. The newborn, wrapped in the same English brand of shawl that's been worn by royal babies for 70 years. Yes, that's baby Harry, sporting the same look and held the same way by his late mother, Diana. Today, this child kept royal watchers guessing as to whether he inherited his father's famous red hair. He's changed, his looks are changing every single day. It was only later that they announced his name, Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. Perhaps unusual for royals, but Archie is actually one of the most popular boy names in England. We never expected them to be traditional, traditional. Archie's a lovely British name. <laughs> and <laughs> Harrison sounds American, so a, a nice compromise. I think it's really important that they live their lives the way they want to. Mountbatten Windsor is the name created when the Queen and Prince Philip got married. But this royal won't be known as His Royal Highness. They don't want Archie to go forwards into the world with the burden sometimes that comes with having an HRH or a title attached, attached to a royal child. So he's probably going to have much more freedom than any other royal child that's gone before him. The new parents introduced Archie to the Queen and Philip pictured with Meghan's mother, Doria Ragland, as well. Just two days old and already causing a stir with nothing but a name. Thomas Daigle, CBC News, London. I will say the name is growing on me. <laughs> Still ahead on the national. Russia's newest propaganda tool right on track. Chris Brown goes aboard the trophy train. Plus, part three of our series on guns in Canada goes in-depth on smuggling. But first, Canadian doctors changed his life with the country's first ever face transplant. But their work did not end when he left the operating table. Yeah, it was a big year. It was a challenging year, um, but it was uh, an inspiring year also. Catching up a year after a medical first. Next. A year ago, Maurice Desjardins became the recipient of Canada's first face transplant. He'd been very badly hurt in a hunting accident. But one doctor was convinced he could help. And after finding a donor and prepping for months, he did. But even though the surgery worked, Desjardins was not out of danger. There was still a risk his body would reject the transplant. Well, our colleagues at the Radio-Canada Current Affairs Programme, Découverte, told us that story. And tonight, Charles Tissard has a follow-up with the man himself. Vivre 
avec un nouveau visage. Comment ça se passe? Déjà, c'est mieux. Souris? <laughs> yeah, it was a big year. It was a challenging year, um, but it was uh, an inspiring year also. Est-ce qu'une chance qu'elle était là? Oh. So, in our experience with the other 40 or so that have been done in the world, it's exactly what's happened with most of those patients. So, I speak to those, those teams uh, in the States and in France, and they joke, they say, well, you still have your hair, we lost our hair. So, things are going relatively well on our side, but it's a normal experience that first year to have these ups and downs. The worst case scenario was avoided. Maurice Desjardins' immune system did not reject his new face. But that victory comes with a price. He's vulnerable to even the slightest infection because of the immunosuppressants he takes. Maurice, tu fais pas tes exercices, par exemple. Non. Je le vois. Non. Je le vois. Moi, Et c'est parce que ta bouche était ouverte à 3 mm, maintenant c'est à 1, 2 cm. Pourquoi vous avez cessé vos exercices? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Tu étais découragé, Maurice. C'est ça que c'était. It's like when you have a cast on your wrist. If you don't move your wrist for a month, it's going to be stiff. <laughs> Ouvre la bouche. Boom. So it's been around four months where he stopped his, his exercises, and we've seen that he's not able to close his mouth the way he was able to, but I know he'll get it back. Three major infections left him hospitalized for a total of 10 weeks. It all came to a head in March with a serious intestinal infection. C'est quand même un job 24-24. Vraiment, là. Et vous avez donc même cessé de travailler, je pense, pour s'occuper de Maurice. J'ai pas le choix. That job loss has hurt them financially. What's more, for a year now, every week, Gaetan has to do several back and forths between the rehabilitation center, their home, and the hospital. And I didn't realize we didn't have any support, financial support, for these patients. Et malgré tout ça, est-ce que vous regrettez votre décision? Non. Ça vaut toujours la peine. Oui. Oh, oui, oui. Everything about that story, Andrew, is so extraordinary. Mm. Still ahead on the National, when the gunmen stormed their school, they were ready. Heartbreaking accounts of students involved in yesterday's shooting in Colorado in our moment. But first, we continue our in-depth series on guns in this country. Tonight, how illegal guns get in. They hide them in uh, cars, in, in uh, panels in their cars, uh, maybe on them, uh, all kinds of, uh, they're ingenious, uh, to be honest, uh, the way they've, they've come up with hiding. Guns are killing Canadians at a rate not seen in a decade, and police believe about half of the guns used to commit crimes are smuggled from outside the country. Our special series on gun violence continues tonight with a look at that illegal pipeline. The U.S. has roughly half the world's civilian-owned firearms, hundreds of millions of guns, and what's sitting between those guns in Canada? The world's longest undefended border. Terence McKenna shows us what that means. The Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario is one of the busiest border crossings in the country. Canadian Border Services has just been given a large infusion of funding to target our rapidly increasing problem, gun smuggling. Across the country last year, they seized 751 illegal guns, but they know that many more are getting through and contributing to gun violence. Superintendent Jason Crowley of the Windsor Police says gun trafficking is driven by the lucrative market in Canada for unlicensed firearms. You will see a gun, a firearm uh, purchased in the States for potentially, I don't know, $200, $300, and they'll go in the streets for $3,000, $3,500.
Mm -hmm. So very lucrative for the people that are involved in these kind of uh, activities. They hide them. They hide them in uh, cars and in, in, uh, panels in their cars, uh, maybe on them. Uh, all kinds of, uh, they're ingenious, uh, to be honest, uh, the way they've, they've come up with hiding. If stopping guns at busy border crossings is tough, imagine the challenge in remote areas like the Quebec-Vermont border. Here, the frontier is often marked with a pylon in the middle of a field and a slash cut through the woods that goes for miles and miles. There's an issue here, so then we started uh, increasing how many agents we had. U.S. Border Agent Bradley Curtis brought us to a remote spot where you can see how easy it is to sneak across. So this is the border right here. Pretty much everything on this side, this is the United States. Once you cross this uh, old fence, everything on this side, that's up in Canada. I'm kind of surprised. What is border security along the Vermont Quebec border? Are there motion detectors? What is it that's along the border to protect the border at this point? We do have uh, sensors, uh, we do have camera, we have technology that helps us monitor the border area. One of the most remarkable gun trafficking plots in these parts began between the neighboring towns of Derby Line, Vermont, and Stansted, Quebec, which share many facilities including the famous Haskell Free Library that actually straddles the borderline. By tradition, Canadians are allowed to cross over to the U.S. side to enter the library without clearing customs. And if you go in there, you can see this line that separates the two countries, uh, separates the opera house upstairs, uh, there's books on the Canadian side, they get checked out on the American side, so very unique situation. Is it a tricky thing for border services to handle? It is, yes. There's a lot of uh, these strange anomalies across the northern border. This happens to be one of them that we have to uh, work around, work with. In 2011, 34-year-old career criminal Alex Blackos from Montreal came up with a clever plan to take advantage of the unique library. What he was doing was basically he ended up uh, recruiting these uh, co-conspirators. And what they did is they were... Uh, taking money, his money, and going down to Florida uh, to buy weapons down in the Tampa area. He had arranged to rendezvous at the library with his co-conspirators. The accomplices, a man and a woman, entered the library from the U.S. side without having to clear customs. The man went to the washroom and deposited a backpack containing 10 handguns in the wastebasket there. Mr. Vlacos entered the library from the Canadian side and retrieved the gun bag from the washroom. Vlacos and his accomplices both left the library going in separate directions without raising the suspicion of the U.S. Border Patrol parked nearby. A few weeks later, Vlacos repeated the trick with 10 more guns in a backpack. This time, the Border Patrol became suspicious and stopped the American accomplices as they departed the library. Something's not right here. Uh, you're uh, you're from Florida, you're in a rental car, why are you, why are you at the Haskell Library? That information was, was documented and basically uh, there was kind of one of our building blocks going forward uh, that helped the overall investigation. The gun smugglers had to come up with a new plan. This time they focused on a remote area 30 kilometers east of Stansted at a place called Wallace Pond. Alexis Vlacos had his American girlfriend drop him off near the border where he hoped to cross undetected into the United States. With his criminal history and the fact that he's a Canadian citizen, he was basically uh, not allowed to make a legal entry to the United States. So the only way to, for him to get into the United States was to uh, illegally enter. His girlfriend cleared customs, then picked him up on the U.S. side. The couple drove off to her hometown of Tampa, Florida to buy more guns. This was to be their big score. Vlacos had his friends legally buy 34 handguns in Tampa. Days later, he was able to cross the border at the same spot carrying the guns. He said he did his best to follow the water's edge, but he got lost. He eventually made it to Canada. His girlfriend picked him up and they both traveled on to Montreal. His border crossings into and out of the United States went completely undetected. Uh, I've been with the United States Border Patrol for almost 25 years. 
We have 295 miles of border. Uh, we have over, just over 300 agents that are on the road. We can always use more personnel. We can always use more technology. We, we do a pretty good job detecting it. We're not really at all places at all times. Montreal police later found some of Lacos's guns during drug raids. And U.S. authorities were able to trace them, first to his American girlfriend and then to him. He pled guilty in the U.S. for illegally trafficking 104 firearms and served almost two years in a Montreal jail. His Canadian lawyer, Eric Sutton, is not surprised by how easy it was to sneak across the border. If that's really what you want to do, um, I think there are multiple opportunities geographically to take advantage of this border. And there is some surveillance, um, but they can't possibly control every, every uh, linear inch of this border. It's impossible. It's inconceivable. You know, they're talking about a handgun ban in Canada now, an assault weapons ban. What do you think that would do to the situation of, of, of the border? You know, uh, hard to say, but uh, um, human behavior would lead that, you know, would, would lead someone to uh, conclude that if it's easier and cheaper to get it somewhere else, they might go that route. There's money to be made. Yes, sir. They're going to try to get it across the border. Yes, sir. Back on the Windsor-Detroit border, police came across an even more devious gun trafficking scheme. Dreamed up, they say, by small-time Canadian gangster Lamar Porter. He would buy guns in the U.S. and hide them in gun socks along with a GPS tracking device. He would cruise the parking lots of Detroit shopping malls looking for cars of Canadian cross-border shoppers and hide the guns inside their bumpers. The cross-border shoppers would then return to Canada along the Ambassador Bridge, completely unaware of the guns they were transporting. Guided by the tracking device, Porter would then go to their Windsor homes and retrieve the guns in the middle of the night. Eventually, police discovered the gun smuggling route through wiretaps of Toronto gangsters who were buying the guns. They followed the gangsters to this Windsor club, where Porter was photographed conducting his gun sale transactions. They were all arrested. Generally, how do smugglers get caught? I think intelligence is a big part of it. Um, you know, people talking, right? Uh, that's part of it. Uh, you know, disgruntled uh, partners, friends, criminals, mm -hmm. um, that so kind of thing. Somebody gets caught and rats out their partners. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's no honor among thieves, they say, right? Gun traffickers frequently try to grind off the serial numbers from weapons to prevent tracing, but police are often able to detect the numbers anyway. Like this is on the polymer part of the, the firearm, so they could sand it, they could grind it, but a lot of these guns are they're, they're ingrained in the body of the gun, in the, in the integrity of the gun. Uh, that's, where they're, that's where they're recovered. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. So. These are all semi-automatic firearms. They all fire as fast as you can pull the trigger, they all fire. While police find new ways to trace guns, criminals are coming up with new ways to obtain weapons like this. Hell yeah. Edmonton police recently found handguns being illegally converted into fully automatic machine pistols, some of which can fire over 30 bullets in two seconds. Ontario police found small-scale manufacturers assembling guns from easily obtainable parts, weapons that would be totally untraceable. To be able to find this group that's manufacturing and distributing is, is actually quite unique and is, is a big deal. Near Aurelia, Ontario, gun store owner Wes Winkle says that key parts of weapons can now be made with 3D printers. Yeah, if you have uh, a polymer injection machine or a 3D printer uh, nowadays, this type of uh, component is not a hard thing to manufacture. You can produce them at high volumes for a relatively little cost. And when they're manufactured, they're, there's no uh, tracing or no uh, numbers put on them at all. And therefore, we get the term ghost guns or, or what are being assembled as uh, a criminal element firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to sell, say that every gun told a story. Not so much anymore. Not so much anymore. And, and, uh, Another as, method uh, of gun trafficking in Toronto involves what is called straw buying. One university student with a gun license bought 22 weapons in 16 weeks, most from the same store in Toronto, then sold them to criminals. 
No one at the store or at the Canadian Firearms Office raised any alarm about his suspicious behaviour. Wes Winkle doesn't see straw buying as a big problem. So straw purchasing is a hot button topic and uh, you know it's it's one of those things where uh, you know there's been some instances uh, however minuscule they are but there has been some where there's been people hired to get a firearms license and then go out and purchase firearms with that license for the criminal element. Minuscule. <laughs> I, I saw various cases where a guy goes in and buys 47 guns and, and, and the gun store owner doesn't report them and the RCMP doesn't seem to do anything about it. You know, at, at, at face value you say that seems to be ludicrous that it's possible that, that could happen and, and uh, you know, um, for the most part when you see that it's been happening uh, through purchases at multiple locations. I'm asking you now from the point of view of gun salespeople, Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't that trigger a common sense alarm? You do understand though that at every type of retail store there could be as many as 25 different employees running the counter and if you're coming in at different times and different things it's it's difficult at the retail level to remember every face and every name. The, the industry was quite surprised to find out that that's not something that would have been flagged at the Canadian Firearms Registry. We kind of expected that would be the case. While police and border security put a great deal of effort and money into countering illegal weapons, the truth is that as long as there is a market, the guns will keep crossing the U.S.-Canada border. A greater challenge is to address the demand from Canadian buyers. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Windsor. Among those struggling to tackle the demand for guns, mothers who have lost children to gun violence. And that's where our series will go next. Who's the gang? The gang, they are human beings, they have a mother, they have a right to live. Nobody has the, the right to take their life. The cause of why they're involving in the gang. Like, why don't we plan prevention mechanisms that to prevent them not to involve? These are the ch children we are talking about. Tomorrow marks the 74th anniversary of the Nazi defeat in Russia. Victory Day in that country has become a huge holiday in celebration of Russia's military strength. But this year it's being celebrated with a modern conflict in mind. Russia's recent military intervention in Syria. Chris Brown explains why in tonight's dispatch from Yaroslavl, Russia. The city of Yaroslavl, over a thousand years old, on Russia's mightiest river, the Volga, is famous for its stunning, colorful church domes. But on this day, it's the city's main train station that's the center of attention. This is a Syria breakthrough train. It's a traveling exhibition of Russian war trophies from its five-year campaign in Syria. Russia sends humanitarian aid to Syria and helps win back the territory from terrorists, said this young cadet. He's parroting the Kremlin's message about why Russians should feel pride for supporting Basar al-Assad's regime in Syria and helping defeat the Islamic State. Who else will protect the rest of the world if not Russia, said an obviously proud Elena Chikanova. To protect a neighbor, only Russia is capable of that. On board the train are tanks, rocket launchers and small arms, all providing a vivid illustration of the ferocity and complexity of the Syrian battlefield. Have a look at this. This is a, a former UN vehicle, in fact, that as we understand it used to patrol the Golan Heights but somehow ended up in the hands of uh, uh, Syrian opposition forces and then was captured by ISIS and has now uh, been recaptured and put on this train. It's fair to say the equipment on the train represents an accurate portrayal of what we saw when our crew visited Syria's desert in 2017. Russia's military took us to a captured Islamic State factory where tanks had been modified and packed with explosives for suicide missions. This is the terrorist technique, said the soldier, noting the extra armor plating that was added so this vehicle could ram checkpoints. Still, the narrative that comes with the trophy train is right out of the Kremlin's propaganda talking points. This military equipment will show, said Major General Yuri Yevdyshenko, the international level of help for the terrorists. He's telling the crowd that Western countries aided terrorism 
and the Islamic State, and there's no mention of Western claims that Russian airstrikes killed thousands of Syrian civilians and propped up a murderous regime. Some of this equipment, in fact, may never have been used by the Islamic State. Take this converted Toyota Land Cruiser. The lettering here suggests, in fact, that it was once the property of one of the many Western-backed rebel groups that was fighting the Assad regime. One of the more egregious examples of distortion is the so-called chemical weapons display inside one of the train cars. This lab was found in April 2018 by residents after fighters were driven out of the city, said the soldier. That's a likely reference to the gas attack in Douma, near Damascus, around the same time that left 70 people dead. Much of the world blames Assad's forces for the attack, and the UN agency that investigated said it found no evidence to support Russia's claims that opposition fighters were behind it. But many Russians here accepted what they were told. I understand the terrorists use this, said Vladimir Gosev. Others, such as Irina Kasnikina, who teaches English in Yaroslavl, were more skeptical. For Russians, it, it is maybe to increase their enthusiasm and to support our authorities, maybe, but um, war is war. This tour comes at a time when Russian support for military missions overseas is decidedly mixed. Almost third of Russian, every third of Russian, uh, said that it brought no good, no harm. Independent pollster Stepan Goncharov says with a weak economy, Russians are lukewarm at best to the Syria mission as they don't see what economic gain it brings. They understand that government should spend money more inside Russia than outside, and this is the main point for them. Whether or not the Syria train won over any skeptics, it did draw good crowds, so it accomplished at least part of its mission. Human rights groups and Western governments will continue to argue with Russia over the rest. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Yaroslavl. Next on The National, protecting their classroom at all costs. Students willing to stand up to a gunman. That's in our moment. She was crying and everything. She was saying, why, why would he, why would he do that? Because but that's him. He, you know, why? I wish he wouldn't do that. Tonight, we're learning more details about the latest deadly school shooting in the U.S., including the many acts of bravery that took place. One student, Kendra Castillo, died lunging at the gunman. The others say they were ready to do the same. So in tonight's moment, we ask why these students were prepared to lose it all in order to protect their classmates. My wife and I knew right away that it was something that he would do. In fact, you know, and she was crying and everything. She was saying, why, why would he, why would he do that? Because, but that's him. He, you know, why, I wish he wouldn't do that, you know, but that's Kendrick. That's a Kendrick thing. He would not let somebody get hurt, you know, if he had anything to do with it. If he had to be there to protect somebody, that's what he was going to do. But his son wasn't the only one trying to save lives. 12-year-old Nate Hawley was also ready to stand up to the gunman. I had my hand on the uh, metal baseball bat, just in case. I was going to go down fighting if I was going to go down. The fact that my 12-year-old has to tell you that and everyone else that, you know, the, the situation that he, he went through, um, I, I, I certainly couldn't have, done, couldn't have done it when I was his age. Yeah, and Ian, both accounts so sad, right? I mean, Kendrick's case clearly, but, but I mean, that any 12-year-old would be contemplating how to fight off a gunman and actually be prepared to do it. it. It is hard to put yourself in his shoes. And you know, Andrew, we despair about these school shootings. What is it that makes a society have so many of these? But at the same time, there, there is something to celebrate, and that is that, you know, Kendra Castillo, an 18-year-old high school student, uh, Riley Howell, he was the student in uh, North Carolina University. Both of those uh, young men just decided when they saw a gunman to go there and uh, wrestle the gunman to the ground. They got killed. They saved their classmates. That's an extraordinary thing. That is The National for Wednesday, May 8th. Good night. Good night.